I want to tell you a story, the story of a war that ended decades ago in the Middle East and what it can teach us about mental health. Mind you, though, I'm not going to tell you another story about war trauma, which is probably the first thought that crossed your mind. Instead, I want us to think differently about both mental health and the Middle East. Stories matter. And what matters even more is the way stories are told. These days we keep hearing stories about the region, black and white fragments and snapshots about this and that immediate crisis and conflict as if they were given and inevitable. Buzzwords mislead. And yet, in the midst of this illusion of overexposure to other people's stories on our phones, we assume that we know the stories of people and places. We've become short-term spectators. What we don't hear often, however, are the stories of how we got here. Now, how many of you in this room know much about the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s? Let me show of hands. Well, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the end of one of the longest and deadliest trench wars of the 20th century. In 1980, just a year after the Iranian Revolution, Iraq invaded Iran and ignited a war that lasted eight years, longer than both world wars combined. It eventually ended in 1988. Now let's think about how this story is told. In academia and in policy circles, it's usually told in the language of military and geopolitical analysis, which creates the illusion that the war ended. But did it, really? According to statistics, it didn't. It left behind over one million deaths in both countries, 200,000 Iraqi soldiers killed, half a million Iranian disabled veterans, 150,000 Iranian orphaned children. Iraq targeted Iranian civilians and Iraqi Kurds with missiles and chemical weapons. And today more than 100,000 victims of chemical warfare continue to suffer physically and psychologically. And of course in Iraq, additional wars and sanctions continue to this day. Each war has an afterlife a physical one and a psychological one. And those of us who study this afterlife use another language, the language of statistics and pathology, the number of the dead and casualties, or the presence of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Of course, these numbers and labels are important and we need to do everything we can for those who suffer from mental illness. But when the psychological impact of wars is reduced only to illness, we create another illusion, that what's needed is only a clinical solution. But what are the stories behind these numbers and labels? Well, we often tell those stories in binary narratives, and we focus on extreme conditions, victim, survivor, death, life, illness, health, being traumatized, being resilient. And in such stereotyping, we diminish the complexity and diversity of life stories. What I want to do today is to focus on the gray zone in between these extremes, the seemingly quiet places that are often overlooked in discussions of mental health. Now, what images come to your mind when I mention childhood and war? What if instead I asked you to imagine a war as it is lived through the eyes of a child, a child who's not physically injured, but whose entire childhood is shaped during wartime? Her name is Sarah. The daughter of a veteran Sarah was in elementary school 
when her family was displaced from a war zone city and relocated to Tehran. But even there, the war was everywhere. It was alive in the news, in the media, in school, in the architecture of the city. And it keeps coming back in her memories. I remember a lot of things. I remember staying up all night praying for my father. I remember missing my friends. I remember collecting money for soldiers. The piggy banks that the school had given us were in the shape of grenades. I remember the sound of bombs. I remember my mom's hasty phone calls to find out whose house was hit. To this day, the sound of fireworks still triggers such panic in me. Somehow, at the age seven, I knew exactly what the war meant. But make no mistake, we're not traumatized victims or nostalgic mourners. I mean, looking at war footages, you might think our childhood was a massive trauma. I mean, yes, it was horrible and scary, but there was also life. I remember the first day of school. I remember the taste of strawberry ice cream, my uncle's wedding, and my sister's obsessive dancing to Billie Jean. Life goes on. I remember how we'd wait all day for five o'clock to watch cartoons on television. But of course the bloody thing could be suddenly interrupted with the sound of sirens telling us to run to shelters. Sometimes we'd spend the night in our building's basement shelter. Neighbors became one big family, sharing snacks and stories and rumor and gossip. Mr. Mokhtar was planning her son's wedding there. Mr. Abbasi was fiddling with the radio, tuning to Radio BBC for the real news. Of course, we were the lucky ones not living in war zones. We got to have imaginary friends and fill the gap between missile attacks with cartoons and play and mischief. You know, my generation is who it is today because of and in spite of that war. How then can we understand the psychological impact of wars? You see, as clinicians, we often focus on individual um, experiences, such as psychological trauma. As anthropologists and social scientists, on the other hand, we study the cultural and social impact of wars. I happen to be someone with a foot in each discipline. And over a decade of work on generational memory among Iranians, I've tried to combine psychological and anthropological perspectives and to think about mental health in a way that is faithful to both individual and collective experiences. Uh, one of the things that I do in my book is to show how the social transformations of the 1980s shaped the identity of those who were children at the time. This was the decade of many intersecting ruptures in Iran post-revolutionary turmoil and the repression of political dissent inside the country, and of course the imposition of war and sanctions from the outside. What is striking in stories like Sarah's is how the phrase, our generation, always surfaced. For Sarah, the war is an integral element of her generation's identity. I found that in telling their stories, the individual I immediately transitions into a collective we, seeking recognition and comfort in a shared identity that gave meaning to their experiences. And I found that these generational identities deeply inform a society's sense of well-being and its relationship to the future. Do they perceive themselves as victims or as heroic survivors? No, but the past has shaped their way of being in the world. You see, remembering for them is not only a psychological necessity, it is also a political claim, a claim to their version of history, to alternative narratives of loss and neglect, narratives that are often obscured in the ways official histories are written. For many Iranians, for example, the statistics I shared with you earlier 
are painful reminders of a war protracted by state propaganda and deceit and a painful reminder of their common knowledge that the United States and European governments willingly provided Saddam Hussein with chemical weapons, intelligence and impunity. And so when decades later the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003 was justified the way it was, the hypocrisy was not lost on them. They remembered what the world seemed to have forgotten. But such remembering is not a passive space of resentment or resignation. On the contrary, it becomes a drive for political participation, for civil society, for art, music, for being part of a global conversation. Their collective memories are painful. And yet, they're culturally generative, creating their own worlds with new expressions, new forms of kinship, identity politics, solidarity, and even humor and new hopes and aspirations for a world without wars. But is there a place for this kind of remembering when we talk about mental health? This is precisely the gap I'd like to address today. You see, from a clinical perspective, we study wars looking for signs of trauma and individual symptoms such as Sarah's reaction to the sound of fireworks. No doubt, it is crucial to treat individual symptoms. But what about when collective grief and solidarity last for decades and seep into the social mind? What if people actively remember and seek recognition and accountability and dignity as much as they demand clinical help? You see, the problem begins when trauma becomes our primary lens for understanding everything that wars leave behind. When we measure psychological well-being only in terms of disorder and symptoms, we silence the social and political life of memory. We mask the powerful agency with which people endure and overcome. So we medicalize and we depoliticize experiences that are in their essence political tragedies. And why does this matter now, you might ask? Because this political afterlife should be part of our understanding of mental health. Because each of today's ongoing conflicts are writing the story of future moral aspirations and claims to truth. And that future belongs to all of us. My work on the Iran-Iraq war made me realize how badly we need to rethink the way we understand mental health and, and in general well-being in this region that we've come to call the Middle East, a region that is increasingly misrepresented today and its diverse cultures and histories are reduced often to stories of conflict and trauma and war and religious tension. Such representations have both ethical and clinical implications. As you know, in many mental health and humanitarian debates, and even in TED Talks, we keep hearing demands for more and more clinical intervention in the region. That's surely necessary. But the solution to a political problem cannot be solely a medical one. We need an inclusive mental health paradigm that can also incorporate the social meaning of experiences that escape statistics and diagnostic labels. We need to understand how history is psychologically imprinted in the collective mind over time. We can then make better clinical decisions, better policy, and perhaps think twice before we talk of human lives as collateral damage. Obviously, these discussions about politics and justice are not new. Many thinkers have been talking about this for a very long time. But it is as if these discussions belong in academia or journalism or art or politics in fields that are separate from healthcare. What I'm arguing here is that they need to be part of our discussion about mental health. And this is why in 2014, I launched a collaborative platform in order to invite scholars, policymakers, healthcare professionals, uh, historians, artists, 
into an interdisciplinary conversation about what mental health means in the region. I organized the pilot workshop that year and some of the amazing experts that I invited were puzzled at first. They would say, well, but I don't work on mental health. I'm an artist or I'm a historian or I work on poetry. And my response was always exactly, that's why I'm inviting you, because you do work on mental health. And that's how our conversation began. And three years later, uh, a wonderful colleague joined me in running the platform and together we are now expanding it. I call this initiative Beyond Trauma because if we understand mental health as more than a clinical issue, we can then expand our clinical perspective beyond trauma, beyond the short term, and beyond the individual. What do I mean by that? First, to go beyond trauma means not imposing a one-size-fits-all approach everywhere. Instead, let's ask how people experience and live through psychological pain and with what cultural and therapeutic resources. What can we learn from the region's diverse medical histories, moral traditions, its dynamic oral cultures, storytelling, poetry, everyday practices? Second, to go beyond our um, short-term focus, shifting from crisis to crisis means sustaining our attention. Asking what happens not just now but decades later when the dust settles and when children grow into adults. What anxieties, aspirations and politics do they internalize? And finally to go beyond the individual means that the meaning of collective experiences should be part of the debate. That mental health is not an issue separate from justice, accountability, and empathy for people's political plight. And so today, as we near the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, let's remember that wars do not end. They continue to live on in cities, in bodies, in the collective mind. They shape the future. And let's remember that across Syria and Yemen and Gaza, as was the case in Rwanda and in Vietnam, there are always new generations of rememberers. We are where we are because we have failed to look back and listen, because we have abstracted other people's pain. We're all implicated with our failure of imagination, political will and empathy. And finally, let's remember that for every story that is told, another is made invisible. So the next time you hear bite-sized headlines in the news, I ask you to pause. Question how people's stories are told. Ask what stories are muted. Awaken your imagination. Picture the life behind those headlines. Look for stories people tell, not the stories written about them. And in this storm of buzzwords, tune your ears to stories of love and loss and hope and pain and pleasure. Stories that are no doubt complex, unpolished and unfinished, as is life itself. Thank you. <laughs>